then we are still like a yeah shasso clock right like <laughs> three zero so let's 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 give some time and then uh, and then we can start introductions uh, welcome everyone just uh, we are giving some time for the rest so pick your place yeah I really miss the I mean I really really miss this part of the meetups like so going to the place and saying hello and uh, <laughs> getting something to drink, uh, fighting with the projector because it doesn't work, that kind of <laughs> that kind of that kind of thing. So how was the 2020 for the Pi Ladies? Pretty excited. From from March completely online. Yeah. Um, also, we were like looking for sponsors to start a boot camp, and we were so you know like concentrated on finding the proper spot. It was a lot of talks with big companies, and then because of COVID, we we're so happy because then we had online boot camp, and more than one hundred twenty people joined it from all over the world, and we have like eighteen mentors from all over the world. So it was like whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and then we started YouTube channel. We started recording. Uh, videos because let's say we're doing talks uh, once or twice per year and the rest of the mm -hmm. time is workshops so yeah and before that it was only offline events and only some of them were recorded so now you have like everything if you missed it you can go yeah. back you have access to github repo you have access to youtube video and you have access to the content details of the speakers as well if they of course want to share that so we're pretty happy that uh, let's say now we make it really, you know, like reusable. <laughs> let's put in this yeah. way. Yeah, I think that's super nice. Uh, I uh, for for us was similar. Like uh, also getting the speakers was like uh, we have like a Naomi Seder, right? Like uh, uh, so like uh, speakers that were that usually are like keynotes in in our conference. Or we have like a Pi Ladies Berlin, and uh, we did a meetup with the with the Python Island. That kind of things are they were not. I don't think that's possible with uh, with all, all the online. So I think uh, yeah, I'm I'm really really looking forward to be back on the meetup that you can see each other and you can see your faces and have a chat, etc. But I also think we need to get we need to keep some parts like uh, maybe doing the yeah. streaming and uh, because then having the videos is super nice. I still have some videos to do to be honest. Like uh, mm -hmm. I think the last meetups are still waiting for for us to, to do the videos. But uh, yeah, it's, it's it's super good and also being able to have like we had one uh, one one speaker from India. I forgot the name. This it was a girl. I don't remember her name. Uh, I but, think it was Marido. Marido. Yeah. It was her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had the same story. We had two spots at Code Emotion this year. Uh, it was as well online. And we also invited a person from India who otherwise were not able to join us. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted that's... to. I wanted yeah. to ask uh, how, what are your experience with the Code Motion because uh, uh, we refused to, to work with them last time because. Uh, they felt like really want to just use our community as for a marketing because so, they, they do conferences just for uh, basically for profit. Remember that you are live, uh, Jan, just in case that you want to complain about someone else. Like, <laughs> maybe you're okay. No, I would just say, look, uh, for our case, we are literally, we are always overwhelmed with a lot of requests, uh, like m conference that has no relationship with Python or whatever. So all, always bombarded us with a lot of things, just do this, promote us, do this. We're just refusing or we say clearly, what do we need? What do we want? And that's it. And uh, for the, for some events, it work out for some of them don't, it's okay. But because it helped us, we have this like vision, clear vision, and it helped us to make go and no go decision. That's it. Easy as that. Nothing special because if we start to chase all this like diversity tickets and the rest of the story, diversity and inclusion bullshit, you will just bog it down with it. I'm not going to promote free of charge tickets one day before events. I'm not, look. It's nonsense. <laughs> and just to say, uh, because our logo will be somewhere on the page, once again, unrelated to Python or to the conference that has 0.0, .0 Python talks, whatever. No. 
Yeah, that's good. That's good. But yeah, okay, you so, just need to clearly state it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you, you need to make it clear what you want to do. That's that's good. So we have uh, twenty-seven attendees. So hello, everyone. Welcome. We are we are giving some time for the rest to to connect. Uh, but I, I I will I will just mention a few details about Zoom. So if it is your first time using the Zoom webinar, you are now as an attendee, so you only have permissions to raise your hand or to write some questions in the Q and A. So there is a Q and A button. You can click there, write the questions. We'll see it. And we are here with uh, Leona, Bumika, Jan, and Nancy. So almost ready to start. <laughs> um, during the during the talks, if you want to ask a question, you can just write the question in the Q and A, or you can raise your hand, and we are, we are, we can enable your microphone for a few seconds or for a minute, wherever to for you to make a talk. Um, I think we are planning to have learning talks today, so in a few minutes we are going to be sharing like a link. Uh, so if you want to give a learning talk. Uh, you will need to sign there. If you don't know what's a lightning talk, basically it's like a five minutes talk <clears throat> about anything you want to to say. So good for you is that you have five minutes. Good for us if we don't like it, it's only five minutes. <laughs> or if we like it, we can keep asking questions later. And it should uh, be related to Python, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, <laughs> Ideally. Ideally related to Python, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes, but but not uh, limited. <laughs> uh, I I saw in some conference really funny learning talks that were maybe not super related to Python. <laughs> the best one I saw was a was a oh was someone that was a speaker in our meetup, but I saw it in a in a conference in Argentina. So this person was explaining uh, JavaScript dates and doing some really, really funny things, like, uh, I don't know, doing a subtraction in a JavaScript date, and it, it does super weird stuff. So it was a kind of a stand-up, so. I, I like a lightning talk from uh, Miroslav Shejivi. He's a friend of mine. I, I bet some of you may know him from uh, uh, Python conferences. He's, uh, he's becoming a known speaker, and he has this <laughs> lightning talk, because in his day job, he can change between I think like 12 languages fluently, he, he's uh, crazy. And because every language has a specific keyboard uh, layout, he, uh, he found uh, it very problematic for him to change these keyboard layouts like fluently. So he found some program which helps him. And he basically explains how this helped him in every language. And he changed the language in every sentence. So you, you hear like 12 language, twelve or 15 languages within five minutes and you're completely blown away. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay, so I think we are already 38. So uh, yeah. just, just to respect everyone once on time, we, we can start. Um, so something special today. So we are doing this meetup. Uh, it's a Pi Ladies Amsterdam with Python Amsterdam. I'm super happy that we're doing this together. I think uh, we have to do more. So, <clears throat> yeah, I think Bumika, you were you were say a bit about the Pi Ladies. Yeah. So, um, Pi Ladies Amsterdam, we um, we are a not not for profit organization with two main goals. Um, the first one is to um, create a more balance gender balance in the in the IT community or just in the coding community and secondly to do this via more practical coding workshops give hands-on and not just have not just have a series of one-way conversations basically so we do a lot of events every month and we encourage people to code to try out python and different domains different types of talks so that's us and thank you for joining in cool thank you thank you so i'm 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 nico and i'm from one of the organizers with jan uh, jan is also a speaker today so he has the hat the speaker hat so. <laughs> um and yeah we are we are the python amsterdam uh, meetup or community we are just trying to build a 
community here in Amsterdam for Python, and we have been organizing meetups for two years now, or one almost two years uh, since March online. Uh, and again, I, I'm super happy that we're doing a, a meetup with my ladies because this is for me like a, this is our local community. So <clears throat> we need to keep working on that. Um, so I will repeat one more time. <clears throat> if you have a question, please click in the Q&A and write it down there. When the talk is finished, you can raise, click the button in raise hand in the Zoom and we can enable your microphone for ask a question. And I think we are ready for the first speaker. So Aliona, you want to present Nancy? Or I think Nancy, Nancy is so good that she's able to present herself. So I think okay. the space is yours, Nancy. Go. <clears throat> I, 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 I want to ask Nancy, where, where are you streaming from? You are, where are you right now? I am in a small city slash town called Deventer in the Netherlands. Maybe you know nice. it. I don't know it, but I, I would like to go there. <laughs> It's a very pretty city. It's very calm, but still very pretty by the river and... Nice. nice. Yeah. And where are you from? You're from I... the Netherlands or...? Mm -mm. I, was, uh, <laughs> I was born in Spain and I grew up in Puerto Rico. So I'm oh, a mix. nice. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so I'm, I'm from Argentina, so we are two Spanish ah. speakers here. So. Ah, it, was, I, it sounded a bit like Latin Spanish accent, so I, okay, I was not wrong. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got a super strong accent, right? <laughs> That's, okay, so <laughs> it's your, it's, it's no, no, I, I say that it's, no, I, no, no, it's a bad thing, right? It's, a, it's like, <laughs> easy to spot. So Nancy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for being presenting here. Speakers are the most important part of this event. So sure. go for it. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Okay, so I planned around 23 minutes. So if there are questions, please go ahead. I'll start by sharing my screen. So can somebody confirm? Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can yep. I can see your screen. Okay. Well, I will start with the slides. I put this and stuff, so it's too robotic. Just um, excuse it and please ask a question or so. Okay. So hi everybody. Um, thank you for attending the talk. Um, I am Nancy Irizarry Mendes, and I will be discussing data processing with Python, uh, focusing on an application or a pipeline that is containerized, scheduled, and monitored on the Google Cloud platform. For this talk, I built a, resp a repository, which we'll, we, we will go over briefly. I will also discuss implementations of the terms containerized, scheduled, and monitored. So the use case. I believe I have to. Uh, so why the need for such a pipeline? So what I built for this talk is a modification of an application that I built at my last employer. By my contract, I'm not allowed to share my employer's code. And the use case then is of the situation at my last employer. I worked for value to health It's a sister company of a data processor. The largest client was the Dutch Institute of Clinical Auditing. It's abbreviated as DICA. And it's an organization of medical professionals. These professionals focus on the quality of healthcare by monitoring the outcomes of specific medical procedures. To calculate the outcomes, the clinical data from the hospitals is needed, and that is where the data processor comes in. The original pipeline is used to create data that is in turn shown in a dashboard. The dashboard has functionality for, for filtering by the outcomes of the medical procedures and benchmarking between hospitals on a national level. The dashboard is called Kotman Explorative. The problem then is how to combine the domain knowledge of the client DICA with the responsibilities of the data processor so that the dashboard data is constantly updated. Um, taking a closer look at the challenges within the client, the employees with medical knowledge are our programmers. The clinical outcomes are divided into the disease or procedure that the patient goes through in what are known as clinical registries. Often there is a specific programmer working on only one of the clinical registries, but there are also programmers that work on all registries. For the dashboard, sensitive patient data is used. The data processor has a specific legal agreement for handling sensitive patient data, which means certain regulations apply and should be followed. Also, the client is not allowed to access patient data that is not anonymized. Furthermore, the patient data is delivered by the hospitals throughout the year. 
the hospitals can decide when and how many of the patient data they deliver. There is a preference by both the clients and the data processor to show all the available patient data in the dashboard, which means the data should be processed on a scheduled basis. Also, improvements in the setup used by the R programmers allow them to make changes to their scripts more often, which means the calculations of the outcomes themselves should also be updated. So the solution to the challenges is the pipeline called the upload ship. The name is a sort of term of endearment for the application. In the code, I also apply freedom of expression where possible and have, for example, a function called takeoff, therefore the, the ship, the rocket. As mentioned before, the pipeline is containerized, meaning that all the dependencies and necessary code are bundled together into an image and a Docker image at this. It is automated or scheduled so that the pipeline executes on its own at a specific time and day. And critical errors are thrown and in turn monitored by triggering the automatic sending of an email. So what can you build? To show a possible use of the pipeline, I created a simple dashboard in Google Data Studio. As uh, we will see, uh, the pipeline uploads the output data to Google BigQuery. This is the, the table here. This is in Google uh, Data Studio. You can generate a link like this one. And this is data from the Netherlands and shows the total number of hospital admissions of patients with COVID-19 aggregated by province. And then I added a simple map and a bar chart just for illustrator, illustration purposes. We can note down these numbers and at the end of the talk, I will manually trigger the pipeline. So if there are no patients, which we hope not, then these numbers will change. So the highest number of patients is in North Brabant with 763,163. And in Groningen, the least 24,119. Um, this is the website that hosts the data. It's from the Institute abbreviated in Dutch as RIVM. In English, that is the National Institute for Public Health and the Information and the Environment in the Netherlands. And the specific source that I use for this talk is the CSV file. So the implementation, let's take a look at the upload chip. There's some takeaways. Please keep in mind that the application is custom made it also has a number of components. So if you are a professional that uses Python, a programmer or a data engineer or a data scientist, then I think the most important things for you to take from this talk are the following. One is the code structure, which is like a robust custom made ETL application as exception handling so that many different data sources can be processed without errors in one source causing the pipeline to fail. The Docker file, which creates an image with both Python and R and the Google Cloud Platform Services. In case you have never seen the console and some of the services used, then this can be a good introduction to some of them. Code overview. We will now go through the code that does the actual ETL process. My choice was to have a main file that executes each of the steps of the pipeline and has robust exception handling. Like I said, I think that a good takeaway is exception handling. So if you're interested in learning that, which I recommend, unless you work in a company where there is someone that will write exception handling for you, then go ahead and look at my implementation, at least for inspiration, since the upload ship executed for many months, and I believe still does, and with the caveat that there might be possible improvements. In this main point py file is where the mentioned takeoff take function is. Then there is an extract.py file that performs a GET request on the host of the input data set and downloads it to the container. Ideally, this would also be the place to connect to a database say, for gathering input data sets. Then the, in the pipeline is the transfer.py file. The file executes the R files, which contain calculations, aggregations, and such manipulations on the input data sets. By convention in the application, the output data set of an R script is a CSV file. Then to help in debugging and monitoring the R scripts, the standard error output of executing the R scripts is saved into log files. In case there is an error in running an R script, which remember are written by external R programmers, 
and, and which are indirectly determined by checking that there's no output data set. The log file is uploaded. The lo upload location is accessible by a person responsible for this process. So you can think of a product owner, for example. The last formal step in the application is in the load.py file, which uploads the output data set, in this case to Google BigQuery. This is Google's cloud solution for tables that need to store and perform queries on big data. Next, we'll take a brief look at the repository. I have it open. Um, so the repository structure, if you are familiar with the cookie cutter Python library, then you might recognize the structure. The library helps a lot because as far as I know, there is no best practice Python project structure. So if you use it, the project will have a structure that is easily recognizable by other users. Also for creating Docker images, it becomes handy because you already know what needs to go in the image and how to run the container. I use a Conda environment for developing locally. Actually, an improvement point for me would be to include the versions of the packages, so please excuse that. Then there are two additional uh, directories uh, comparing to a cookie cutter project. One is the Docker local directory, which has files for building the image and running the container locally. And the second additional directory is the K8S deploy, which might need to be renamed since Kubernetes is now at version 9, I believe but it should be okay. These YAML files are used for running the pipeline in Google Kubernetes Engine, as I will ex explain a bit later. Let's take a closer look at the architecture with this schematic. This is for the original pipeline. These dotted boxes indicate an external element, this upper one, is a database with patient data, and that was used by yet another application of my employer. Serialized R objects were created and uploaded to Google Storage, where in turn the upload ship would extract them from. This other element in the bottom illustrates the R scripts written by those with domain knowledge. Since those, since those changed quite often, the original upload ship checked out the repository at each execution. Actually, I should mention repositories in plural, since the upload ship worked for several corporate clients, each client with their own repository of R scripts. The upload ship that I am sharing now is this one. You will notice that now there is just one external element and that is the raw or input data sets that we looked at from the RIVM or the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment in the Netherlands. If you remember the code overview, the extract.py file downloads the input data set Possibly the Institute has a proper API or API, but since this talk is to illustrate an automated pipeline, I simply download a CSV file. Also different in this modified upload ship is that the R scripts become part of the image and are deployed with the pipeline to Google Kubernetes Engine. Referencing again the code overview we went through just now, the transform.py file executes the R scripts on the input dataset. As mentioned, the output of the R scripts are CSV files, and the load.py file takes care of uplo uploading these to Google BigQuery. And as mentioned, in case there is no output file, it is interpreted as an error. And for monitoring, the log file is uploaded to Google Cloud Storage. I can imagine that some of you may be thinking that this can be optimized. Indeed, it may be possible to write directly to Google Cloud Storage instead of making an output CSV file. And please keep in mind that the original upload ship used external R scripts and that code was written by external R programmers. For the modified upload ship in this talk, I simply carried over this convention, which admittedly can be improved upon. Also that the scripts are written in R can be seen as a point of improvement since then the container becomes larger and the time to build the image is longer, plus all the R dependencies that need to be taken into account. But again, this is simply following the convention. On the other hand, it is true that many people use R and are comfortable with it. So if you ever need to run their code in an automated and monitored way, then the upload chip has code to do that. We saw, we saw the Google Data Studio dashboard, which is uh, illustrated by the blue box in the bottom. And finally, there are the log files uploaded to Google Storage, which I will show shortly when I execute the upload chip manually. For this talk, I created a quite extensive readme file with instructions 
hopefully everything should work. If you wanted to check out the repository and run the code locally or in your own Google Cloud Platform project. So I want to discuss two sections of the readme briefly and have the idea to do it with two diagrams. In the setup section, you will find instructions to create several elements, three main ones. First, you need to create a Google Cloud Platform project. Many of the services offered have a free tire. The virtual machine used for the Kubernetes cluster will not be free, so keep that in mind. To create this stock, the billing in my project is currently at around 11 euros since the cluster was made around two weeks ago. The second element is the Kubernetes cluster, which is created in the Google Cloud. I created it from the console for this stock. Since in my work, I was not responsible for creating or maintaining the cluster. In the console, you can output the command used to a terminal command. And I provided that command in the readme file. A bit later on, I will show the resulting cluster in Kubernetes engine. And the third element you will need is to download and install Docker. It is software for containerizing applications like the upload ship. Having it locally in your laptop is useful because it allows you to also run the image in a container locally while you are developing the application. In the readme, there are instructions for building the image and that is also done locally. It does take considerable time and computer resources to build a Docker image. There are other ways to build an image. For example, some remote code repositories have the functionality and also in the Google Cloud, it is possible. So keep that in mind if you're interested in optimizing the process. The other section of the readme that I would like to talk about is running in Kubernetes engine. The steps in the section are dependent on each other. The first step is to build the image, in this case using Docker, which means you need a Docker file listing the operating system, any system libraries that are needed for installing other software and running the pipeline, and the software de development kit and the dependencies that are used by the pipeline itself. At the end of the Docker file, you state the entry point of the container. As I said earlier, the project structure makes it easier to make a Docker file since we know which project directories need to be added to the image, as well as which is the entry point of the container. The second step in the section is quite easy. It is specific to Google Cloud and requires tagging, tagging the Docker image so that it can be uploaded to the right container registry. Container registry is a Google Cloud Platform service for hosting Docker images. The container in the Kubernetes cluster that runs the pipeline pulls the image from container registry. So that is why the image needs to be pushed, uh, uploaded. That is also the third step, pushing the image to container registry. The fourth step is to deploy the application or pipeline to the Kubernetes uh, engine cluster that we created. In this case, I use a cron job, which has functionality for scheduling pipeline executions. If you are familiar with the cron utility at operating system level, then a cron job works in a very similar way. The syntax for scheduling an application is the same. The last step is to monitor pipeline errors. Because of the specific use case of the upload ship, monitoring alert and alerts are custom made. My implementation was to write Python code that writes a critical log level message when there is an error. The critical message is written to the standard output of the Kubernetes cluster. In the Google Cloud Platform, that output can be managed through a slightly different service known as Google Logging. I combine log logging with Google Monitoring to create an alert for log messages with the word critical. That alert sends an email message every time a critical log message is registered. Okay, so now let's uh, run the upload ship. As mentioned, the schedule and it done in that sense automated, but now I will attempt to execute it manually so I can show that it is working. Okay. By the way, I'm not sure if uh, there's some question or so, so. I don't see anything, so I will continue. Um, yeah, there is no question. In... Great. Here we are in the uh, Kubernetes engine and we can see the Kubernetes cluster that was created. You can specify a name for the cluster. It is possible that there are some requirements to that name, such as the use of dashes or no underscores or exceptional characters. Navigating to workloads, we find the deployed cron job. Again, this is a chosen name with at the end the word test. 
If you are familiar with the development test accept and production stages of development, then this word indicates that stage. I use the convention of writing which stage it is at the end of the name, but I can imagine that other conventions can be useful. Let's enter the cron job and let's look at the configuration. If you look in the code repository in the directory that I mentioned earlier, k8s deployed, then you will find this YAML file, though I believe Google adds some default lines here and there. Some important things to mention are the schedule. As mentioned, you can see that it is the same syntax as used in cron and cron tables. You can see the last scheduled time, proof that is automated. Because of the use case and the stages of development, the upload ship has functionality for accessing Google services in different Google Cloud Platform projects. This is a bit out of scope, but I will mention that to access those different projects, the permissions files that are needed by the application are mounted to volumes in the container. And this is what you can read in these lines like this. Another important thing to mention is the entry point, which the cookie cutter library helps us with, as mentioned previously. And that is these three lines. In the Docker image, the code is copied to the SRC directory. And you can see here that the mentioned main.py file is executed from that location. Now let's look at some more configuration that gets created from YAML files. One is the secrets, which can be passwords and such information that you need uh, with the container that you need to share with the container, but want to protect access to, you can encrypt passwords, upload them as a secret object, mount them in the container, and from that volume, the pipeline can access them. This other configuration file is custom made for the upload ship. It is a collection of variables that become environment variables in the container, and so can be accessed by the pipeline when it is executed. Here you can also see the development stage reflected. Um, other interesting variables allows the processing of, for example, different corporate clients, different data sources, and such multiple instances of something. For this talk, I use the terminology source. So for example, source one can be the RIBM like we looked at, while source two can be the World Health Organization and so on. It can happen that you want or need to keep these data sources and the output separate. So the upload ship has functionality for doing that. The data dashboard, the data studio dashboard that I showed, for example, only uses the source one data set and table, which you can see reference here in these two lines of configuration. Sorry, these two. This other line of configuration environment variable we will see again a bit later, log files bucket. It indicates which Google storage bucket to use to upload the log files with the error messages. If you are looking at the curly braces and cannot make out what they do, that is because when the pipeline executes, the curly braces are used for looping and decoupling same code that runs on different sources. So for example, you have source one and source two, both outputs of which need to be uploaded to Google BigQuery. So we have one generic variable with curly braces and specific um, environment variables without, so like these ones. And then you see that the curly braces would be here. All right, now let us do a before and after and look at the BigQuery tables and storage buckets before and after manually executing the pipeline. This is the Google project, Nimela test, and inside you can see two data sets, source one and source one backup. The upload ships backs up existing tables, which are used for rolling back in case there is an error when loading a table. The backup tables are under a data set appended with the word backup. If we look at the source one table and its details, we can see the created time, which corresponds to a little bit after the scheduled time of the cron job because the processing takes some time, of course. After executing the pipeline manually, this time shown here will be updated to the current time now. Okay, for illustration purposes, I created an R script that throws an error on purpose so that we can see that the log file will be uploaded to a bucket 
bucket in Google Storage. Here we see two buckets for the, for the two sources. I believe the bucket for source one is old of when I was developing, and so after the manual execution, it will not be created because the R script for source one executes successfully. But if we look in the bucket for source two, then we see the log file that was uploaded from the automated execution of today. Um, I will delete both buckets to show that the one for source two gets created. So I think I have to type. So source one. Delete. And the internet connection is helping. And we'll delete bucket two. Okay, take some seconds. All right. And now let us do a manual run of the cron job. So we go back to Kubernetes engine and the workloads. It is possible to trigger a job programmatically with the kubectl utility, but now I will do it from, from the console. Just click on run now. Okay, so let's see the status. Hoping that everything is working. The container should be Okay, it's creating the container. Bot will be started on it. I hope it doesn't take a lot of time. Um, otherwise, it would be some silence. I will refrain from going into more detail about the containers and pots because uh, my knowledge on it is currently basic. And when the pipeline starts executing, there should also come up a notification on my screen of the email when the alert for the second our script is generated. So in the meantime, so if if if, if you want if you want to make some time, there is a, there is a question. I don't know how much time you oh. have to wait for the. <laughs> we can go ahead because at some point the the notification should show up and it should take some okay. seconds. So Moi me veo. Sorry, I probably mispronouncing that. So he's asking or oh, her. I don't know. Why uploading your logs to a bucket and not using stack driver directly? So I, I do use stack driver to, to, to generate the, the, the logs. I write to them a specific word critical with Python or a log level. And the, the point of uh, writing them to storage was the use case specific in our company. We had the client and I almost never communicated with the client and between me say and the client there was this project um, owner and he would is the one that he would communicate between the two parties and so so that i didn't have to be the whole time checking if the external r, r scripts generated an error then he would go to the google storage bucket and check if there's a log file there was an error because remember the client wrote the r scripts so it was on them to write r scripts that would not generate errors and then I hope that explains. Yeah, I think it does. So, um, so if you're still waiting, I have one, I have more. <laughs> sure. So Yop is asking if the pipeline, does the pipeline have a specific limitations in terms of throughput based? So, yeah, so um, it's, do you it's mean the like, uh, how much it takes up? Uh, so the, I will repeat the question just because I also maybe not. So if does the pipeline have a specific limitations in terms of throughput based? So I think it, I'm not sure. Um, I think there is lower if you go lower to oh. the next question. I think it expanded a little bit at least. Okay, because I was I was seeing a different name. That's why I was ignoring the second one. Yeah, okay. The, the, there is a there is a, a more data. So in terms so limitations in terms of throughput based on a data source repo or in general. So I, I think the question if if your if your throughput is related with the source. Um, you mean like if the data set source is very large or so? 
Um, Probably. I... I'm not sure I understand, but I can give a little bit answer. Um, for example, I can say I didn't care, say, about the cluster. So for me, I just needed to containerize my application, try it out almost in the container, and my colleagues, so, yeah, uh, make sure mm -hmm. that the resources were there. And for the rest, the data was never really large. It's not really a problem in, in healthcare that you have big data. It's actually, uh, there you can see the mail alert. I hope everybody can see it. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so actually we have little data. It's the problem in healthcare. So in terms of, of uh, it becomes too large and you have it in the container and it takes too much space, it never happened. I think maybe the, the question is related to that. Yeah, I would say, uh, Joran, if, if you want, the, I can enable the microphone and, and, and you can, uh, you can re-ask. Or, or maybe Nancy, you want to continue and then we do the questions at the end. As you wish. I, I think I'm pretty much done because you saw the notification. I have some more, more notes, okay. but for the rest, we can have the question if you want. So there is, there is one more. Uh, Sigon is saying, uh, does the setup scale horizontally? If no one needs to be improved. So how you scale basically. <laughs> Like I said, um, I I know my my knowledge of Kubernetes cluster and scaling is minimal. So I know that it runs on Kubernetes and the cluster was there and I can talk to the cluster and such. But about scaling, I, I was not responsible for that. So I think my answer would be, it depends on the cluster settings. And I have very little information on, on that. And for this talk, I like create that a very simple cluster, just the basic cluster. I think I don't even change any of the characteristics, just so I could have my the, the upload ship there. Mm -hmm. Cool. So that was the last one so far. So again, if anyone wants to ask a question live, uh, please click in the right hand, and I can enable the microphone. Okay. So, okay, so should I finish then? Yeah, yeah, go. Yeah, so, okay, so we saw the email that I received. I'll not open, um, can I open for that? Um, well, it's gone, so I'm not gonna open my inbox, but you saw that I received it. And let's see. Uh, so we go back to the BigQuery table. You can see this is the time um, it's current in the Netherlands. Sometimes the, the Google project uses like Greenwich Mean Time. So that's something to keep in mind, but you can see that it was just updated by running um, manually. And if we go to the buckets, so as I mentioned, um, one of the R scripts generates uh, an error on purpose. So there should be a log file and a bucket created. If you remember, I deleted both. And then this one was created and uh, there's the log file. And the log file is just the output uh, that you would get from, from running an R script. Uh, in this case, what I did was a very simple error. Just I did not uh, import a library and then there's an operator it's not available and that causes the error. We can open it. And believe it or not, we had all types of issues with the external R programmers like libraries or they would add uh, an import and then it's not in the container and then that would generate an error and the data will not be updated and all these steps had to happen so that's why the the upload ship uh, kept growing into container and uh, not containerized but the monitoring and such so here you can see this would be the log file then the project manager would read it and would see uh, well whose responsibility is this for example the client or is it me or what and okay, and if we go to the dashboard, so I think I can update it. So the numbers were, okay, so this is, a, let me update it now. Let's hope that it doesn't become larger or the RIBM, RIBM has not updated their, their numbers, but okay, they are the same. So that was it for me. Thank you for the, Attention. I think you cool. can stop Bravo. sharing. <laughs> Thanks.
Yeah, I I I I, I used to have uh, the sound to to, to cap something, but. So thank you. That's that was super interesting. Like a really really complex uh, set. So any any other questions? Anyone wants to ask a question live or just write it down? I, I will I will cheat and I will ask you a question because I was thinking on that. So what was the most the 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 part that was most the most complex because because you were dealing with a million things in this project like uh, the containers yeah. and the cluster and the pipeline and the, everything connected so what, what was the, the the part that was the harder for you or more the most complex to to, to, to work on for me the, the kubernetes getting it there i had a lot of help from a colleague i he's super good in his job and he helped me a lot with the yaml files and such because mm -hmm. then you have the configuration and then the secrets, in my case, the secrets were these SSH keys for checking out the repositories with the R files. And for me, that was a new concept, like secrets mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a cluster. So yeah, I think for me, that was the, the biggest challenge. For the rest, I, I had some experience with Python, so it was just putting it really robust mm -hmm. that it would continue without, if there was an error. Okay, cool. And do, did you have uh, any security concerns, like uh, that uh, you have this code that you're executing that is from someone else? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> in principle, there are our clients and they really only work on okay. the data. So, and, and we, we had access to the repository, so we could always see what they were doing, good and bad. Okay. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> For the rest, um, if you look at the code, and I will not talk a lot about this, it's not, it's not my strong point, but the application is run as user nobody. So then I believe that that means if somebody hacks the application, then they cannot reach the container, the cluster kernel, mm -hmm. and right? So they cannot attack other um, uh, things running in the cluster. That's how I understood mm -hmm. running as user nobody. So those were the two things you can say. Okay, cool. And I also have a quick uh, question. I also would love to cheat a little bit. I'm just wondering uh, what was the situation before that application actually was used? What was the old scenario? Mm, um, I believe it was Pentaho or something. Um, Ooh, okay. Uh, I, I remember at the very beginning, I mean, this was also like for a dashboard. So as you can see, this, is like a, this was in the background of, of the whole thing. But I remember like my boss, when he started talking to me about this new system and I asked him, how do they do it now? And he said, don't worry about that. And I said, okay, <laughs> fine then. <laughs> but I believe they had like this Pentaho and they had like in um, ODS databases, the data. So that, that's why there was this other process that connected to a database and first uploaded to all storage. So. Cool. By the way, we have the, the new question. I think the, the you, last you one, maybe. To, yeah, you want to read it? Yeah. Oh, it's not a question. So, Nicole, go on. <laughs> you can read it. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so Scott is saying, thank you. It was a really good day. It was a very useful work example for me. And he's also saying that it was nice to see the RVM and the DACA uh, using some Python and uh, having some benefit from that. So. OK, cheers. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. Uh, that was a super, super nice talk. So a uh, reminder for everyone, you can just click in the Q&A and ask a question um, or just write in the chat or write, yeah, write your hand. Uh, we we're planning to, to usually we, we like to have a learning talk. So if anyone wants to do that, there is a link that I share in the, in the chat. We already have uh, one learning talk. I will share it again. Whoa. Yeah, so Peter is going to, yeah, how to make a tweet popular. Wow, we need that. So we can use that for the Python Amsterdam. <laughs> uh, so our next speaker is Jan. So Jan is one of the founders of Py Amsterdam. Um, he's from the uh, Czech Republic. Yeah, he has this super nice Python logo in the background. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's your, it's your floor. 
Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, I'll Before I start sharing my screen, uh, my talk is uh, also live. So if uh, for some reason you don't like the quality of a screen shared, you can follow live on the link I just shared. Uh, I'm not a great speaker, but that's one of the reasons I found it uh, by Amsterdam because I wanted to become better speaker. So reminder to everybody, this is a safe space. So if you want to learn to speak, meetups like this are the, the great opportunity. You can start with the light, giving lightning talks and then when you feel comfortable and you have more time to spend on uh, creating a bigger presentation, then go ahead and send us a note uh, you can find us as py.amsterdam. So let me share my screen. So can everybody see my screen? Yes. It looks like this, yeah. Good. So let's start. Uh, I will be sharing uh, with you my uh, journey of uh, using AWS Glue uh, for the first time. The, there are some good things, bad things, and there are some really ugly things which uh, caught, caught me off guard. And if you have never used uh, Glue, then uh, this is something right for you. So what is AWS Glue? AWS Glue is a simple, flexible, cost-effective uh, ETL ser service. Uh, ETL stands for Extract, Transform and Load uh, data. So you have some incoming data in uh, various formats, for example, and you want to first extract them from that format into a common format and then uh, let's say uh, purify the data or anonymize data and then load them into some uh, target uh, either database or or any any other bucket that you can do analytics or, or analysis on this data uh, aws glue is fully managed service it's serverless it uh, it's uh, running uh, Apache Spark uh, as a backend. You can also run pure Python jobs. Uh, for Apache Spark, you can choose PySpark or Scala. AWS, uh, the, the glue com is created from few main components. It's a data catalog. In data catalog, you can define uh, your tables, uh, which is like a internal database. So if you don't have any database, you don't need to use any database. Uh, AWS Glue has one uh, created right for you. It can create, you can create this database from a data. It can intercept how data structure looks and create the tables based on that, or you specify your own schema then you can use this database as one of the data sources for your ETL jobs. Then you have a connections. Uh, connections hold the credentials and the URI strings for a third party or a databases outside the glue. So you can connect it to your RDS or any other uh, database you have. The next component is job. Job contains, uh, job is basically where you write your code or you can generate the code with, uh, a, with a Glue Studio, which is a new feature. It lets you to pick a few components and uh, transitions or transformers and then it creates the Python code, which you can then edit. Uh, I think it, it's nice, but most of the time it's uh, very basic. So if your scenario is 
outside their scope, you have to write your own code from scratch. And for that, you need to learn how to use a PySpark, Pandas, and uh, other data tools. Then uh, these jobs, uh, you can orchestrate the jobs in the, into your ETL pipeline. Let's say you have multiple jobs, which has to be executed in a sequence. So you create your workflow and in the workflow, you bind your job with the triggers. This is this was very confusing to me because the workflow editor is uh, quite visual and I expect it to be a little bit easier, but I will dive into it later on. So for the purpose of this presentation, uh, we will be using this uh, architecture. So our data comes into uh, our raw data are stored in uh, S3 bucket. Then we process this data with the raw to refined glue job. Then we save the refined data into another S3 bucket, which holds the refined data. And then we create, we process them again. And we take the data from S3 bucket into uh, Aurora database backed by a PostgreSQL. So your first job, first time you open a glue, uh, it will probably be uh, AW, using AWS console. Um, you just navigate via UI, click, click add job, and then you will start filling uh, the form. So you fill in your name, you fill the IAM role. This uh, IAM role uh, has must have uh, permissions to uh, run glue, for example, exit, uh, get data from S3 buckets, write uh, to the Postgres, and also write to uh, AWS CloudWatch logs, uh, so our jobs can log. Next thing you select is the job type. Job type can be a Spark or Python shell. This, the, uh, then uh, you select the glue version. Uh, recently, AWS published uh, glue 2.0 uh, with improved startup times before it took even uh, 15 minutes to start your ETL job. So development was very painful if you did not have Spark running on your local host, at least with some sample data. Now with the uh, glue 2.0, I think maximum time I had was five minutes to start the job and it was a very bad timing. Usually it's between one and two minutes, which is super cool. Then you specify your code, uh, which has to be stored in uh, S3. and uh, also some temporary directory, which is uh, filled in by default. In the next step, you can edit your code in a visual uh, editor, still using AWS console, write your code. And that's, like, that's it. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Any questions? No, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> This this was uh, this was just the very first uh, introduction to to glue and this is basically where you end up. Uh, I don't recommend using this uh, visual editor for editing your code because everything uh, will become quite complicated and confusing because you will have differences between what's on your computer and what's in the cloud. So. Let's say we we will want to create more complex application, and we will treat our jobs like uh, like a proper Python application. Uh, 
At first, I was thinking writing uh, AW uh, glue jobs are similar to writing Lambda functions, but it's quite different. And I will show you how is it different. So if you are familiar with writing Lambda functions, don't, don't assume anything you know, because this is what I did and I was very wrong. So based on the diagram I showed before, we will create the same data structure. This will be our uh, directory for, which holds code for all the data sources and then one directory per transition. So we have two transition states from raw to refined and from refined to curated. Then uh, because I I had more than just two jobs. I had uh, probably 15 or 20 of them. I noticed uh, pat similar patterns, so I created a shared uh, library, which uh, from which I reused the code in uh, every job. So first thing you start to deal with is that when you have more than one one uh, script file is that you will have dependencies so basically every file which is not your job script uh, py is a dependency and as a dependency it has to be specified in a path, in a library path or python library path this in if you use this via AWS console dialog, it will just let you select one item and nothing else. But if you read the documentation, it says that uh, this, uh, er this is actually a string of uh, comma separated S3 paths. So if you have more than one dependency, you can specify multiple S3 paths to the dependency. Not to mix it, uh, since we have two different job types, they allow us to use different dependencies or they require us to use a different dependency. So we can use plain py files. These files can be used for shell jobs or PySpark jobs. For PySpark jobs, Specifically, we have to use uh, zip, which is uh, basically just a zipped uh, Python package. Uh, it has to be pure Python package because uh, PySpark does not allow us to have uh, libraries with the uh, C extensions yet. It's not supported. And for Python shell jobs, it has to be uh, Python wheel. Uh, pri all these files have to be uh, loaded in, uh, uploaded in S3 prior to running the job. Otherwise, you will see uh, weird errors. So this is an example how we would specify multiple dependencies. So let's say we need more than one. So we have lib zip a, that uh, comma, and another S3 path. By default, uh, AWS Glue uh, environment uh, contains several libraries which are pre-installed. And this is what you can read in the documentation. What you don't, don't find in documentation is their versions. So the first thing I did I, was to create a very simple job just to uh, understand what versions are there and this is what i saw so if if you have if you look the the pandas are still 0 0.24 which was uh, quite old even when i started this project which was uh, five months ago or six uh, the dependencies have been updated to the more latest later versions in uh, uh, glue 2.0. Uh, 
one important thing uh, now that we have two glue versions one for uh, uh, 2.0 for PySpark jobs and one glue 1.0 for Python shell jobs we also have to deal with two different Python versions one is uh, for glue 2.0 there is Python 3.7 for glue 0 0.1 uh, 1.0 there is a Python 3.6. So it's it's a lot of fun with the dependencies and glue. So and mixing this in your repository is, is great. Then when you install your dependencies and for some reason there is a problem, this is most likely error you're gonna see. Uh, and doesn't matter what the problem is. Uh, basically error says it cannot access the object on the s3 bucket which is ultimately not true because it can access the object for uh, the problem in my case was that the object uh, the the wheel file was man, man, was built for mac instead of uh, linux So uh, now we will look how Glue is executing our code uh, for PySpark jobs. Essentially, if you're familiar with uh, Spark, you've probably heard of a Spark submit command. And uh, behind the scenes, Glue is uh, building this command from our code. So once we upload uh, dependency zip package, to the to S3, it will inject the package into a Python path of a job workspace and unzip the content into slash TMP. Uh, note that uh, your zip package must have your packages in the root there, because normally if when you create zip via command line, there is one more root directory and then you will see the error above, not telling you that this is the problem. And then if everything goes good, uh, AWS glue creates a command uh, spark submit dash dash py, py files and adds basically this directory. So, of course, this is a little bit different for uh, Python shell jobs, because why not? So let's say uh, we have two dependent uh, dependencies and it's NumPy and Pandas. Uh, as you may have noticed, uh, we, need, uh, we need the wheel files for Python shell jobs and they have to be built for Linux because AWS Glue is running on Linux. So in case you download these real files for uh, another architecture, which could be a Windows or Mac, uh, you will, AWS Glue will throw error, not, not being able to access the object on S3. So we need to upload these two files to S3 like so. Then, then these files uh, are uh, iterated through via a magical script uh, called uh, run script pi, which is uh, provided by AWS. And all what it does, it iterates through this list. It takes one file at a time and runs a pip install on the command. Uh, this, this was uh, unknown to me because it's not mentioned in the documentation and caught me off guard because it say you have to provide the wheels. So I assumed I have to provide all the dependencies, including uh, 
including the dependencies of uh, pandas and numpy. So instead of providing two files, I gave it, uh, let's say 15 files. And then I was surprised it is uh, creating uh, problems when uh, installing all these dependencies because instead of installing just what I gave it, it ran pip install for every package and it created a giant mess. So just knowing that you just need to run pip install for only the packages you supply. So why the script is magical? So I was curious what the run script by does. And so I printed the, the code of a run script by via running the job. And then you start looking at the file, you read, oh, they're just, these are just imports. And then you get to the line 15 and you see at basic unit tests. This was uh, quite horrifying knowing that the code, which does not have basic unit tests, uh, runs my production code. I, I bet they have integration tests, I hope. But yeah, this was this was a little bit scary. And then if you read this file further, you will notice how the pip, how they run pip in a, in a for loop. So you can print this yourself if you create a job. So let's, uh, this was something for the start. Now let's uh, start writing some code. So before we start, uh, we need, to, it's uh, good to look at a few things. You will probably be looking for some examples, uh, documentation. So all these uh, items here mentioned are uh, URL links, uh, hyperlinks, so you can visit them. The first one is uh, AWS samples. There are some sample jobs which uh, you can read. Uh, I don't recommend paying too much attention to the jobs, just uh, very briefly, because I noticed there they don't adhere to best practices and uh, their code is not very nice. Then the next uh, repository is AWS Glue Lips. This holds a core functionality of Glue, which you import in your jobs. Uh, even though this is uh, open source on GitHub, they don't read any pull requests or even react to the comments from, from the people on GitHub. So they just every now and then update it. I think every now and then is maybe once a six months maximum. Uh, they don't provide many tests or any examples and it's it's not a fun repo, so it's it's just there. Sometimes it's it's worth looking, but other than that, it's it's not very useful. Uh, then there is a AWS Glo uh, Glue Docs. So in the document documentation is getting better uh, with every version. Sometimes it can be a bit confusing and hard to find things. And then you will certainly want to have a Docker installed and read this AWS blog post. Uh, so before I started, uh, there wasn't, we st were still using Glue 1.0. And uh, for the reason of the slow startup, I, I built or I found partially usable uh, Docker file on a GitHub from someone who had to deal with a similar problem which was uh, installing uh, PySpark and AWS uh, glue lips into the container, which was journey on its own. Uh, and I complained to AWS. Uh, fortunately, we have a good, our company has a good contact with the AWS. So I was able to pass my feedback to the glue team directly. And uh, I was uh, then told that uh, with the glue 2.0, they are going to release a ready-made Docker image. 
for exactly this purpose. And uh, this ready-made Docker image can be found in this blog post and how to use it. Uh, just 15 minutes before this presentation, I tried it and it works and it saved so much hassle. So we are going to create two jobs. So first one will be raw to refine and second one will re refine to curate it. We will keep the structure of the job same for both jobs. We, we are going to have uh, four files, just one make file, one config file, where we handle all the configuration for our job. And uh, then raw to refine py, which is responsible for a uh, business logic and make file to handle the operations around the file, like uh, packaging, uploading, and so on. And of course, requirements TXT to specify our dependencies. So let's go, let's look at the make, what we are going to do in a make file. So on, on line four and five, you will, uh, I'm going to download all the wheel files from, uh, from requirements TXT. I, I ran dash dash no depths. So otherwise it would download all the dependencies of my dependencies, which like I already said, it would uh, create a huge installation and, and a mess for Python shell jobs. On line uh, seven, uh, there is, this is the same process. Uh, this is the same process for a PySpark job. Uh, instead of uh, using pip wheel, I'm using pip install dash t, which is uh, basically uh, specifying the target for the installation. Uh, this target is uh, just any directory. So instead of installing into uh, site packages, it will install to the directory you give it. Then in the next step, I just take my this step, I take my script, job script file, upload it to S3. And in a separate step, I synchronize my dependency files with dependencies on S3. I do this in two different steps because when you are developing, your dependencies do not change that much as your business logic. And sometimes it's useful to just upload your script file and reload the job instead of reloading everything. The next file is uh, has a config py. So we will use this config py as a separate dependency. And what we do in this config py file. First, uh, we you're using uh, our shared library, which we built in a different uh, directory. And we parse uh, command line arguments. Glue uh, offers a specific function, which is called uh, get resolved options. But this function proved uh, not to be very useful. And uh, because it was, its implementation was different for Python shell job and, and Spark jobs. So I have written my own wrapper or uh, my own parser to parse command line arguments for the jobs. We parse uh, arguments, we set up the logging. Uh, as a config object, I decided to use dictionary but if I'm building the same thing now, I would strongly suggest you to use a Pydantic. Pydantic is a great library for validating basically dictionaries and creating nice objects from them. Uh, I recommend you to check it out. It's super easy and very powerful. In the lines uh, 14 to 16, 
we have to define some uh, defaults because there is a difference between shell job and PySpark job that uh, in Python shell job, uh, job ID and job run ID are not available for some reason. So the job cannot refer to itself. So let's break down the, the job code. This is uh, basically our transition.py. Uh, so it's a uh, row to refined or refined to curated.py. This is a pretty simple uh, code for, a, for this example. We just uh, log something uh, to know what's, what's happening. You can see I'm, I'm also logging the, the workflow variables uh, or arguments. These arguments are only available if the job runs in the workflow. They are not available if you trigger job manually. So you don't want to really refer to them when testing because this will create lots of uh, problems. And in this job, we do pretty simple thing. We just download our data set from somewhere. It's a CSV file. And then we write it uh, into a refined bucket as a parquet. So we do this because uh, PySpark likes uh, parquet files. So when, after the first uh, transition, we have a second transition, which is refined to curated. In the refined to curated, we are using PySpark. And again, we had uh, we had our, our config uh, py, which was very similar. And here we get uh, the Spark session and the glue job. These are provided by AWS uh, glue lib, but again, for some reason, it did not fit me. So it I created uh, my own wrapper, which uh, fits all the all the problems I've had. Also, in your help uh, in your shared libraries, you can define some common functions like uh, reading parquet. So if you have more files uh, or more jobs, you don't have to write a long uh, Spark expressions and just uh, use your own functions. Then I have uh, two functions. It's just uh, run ETL and main. In a, in a main, we just start uh, get the Spark session. And with this session, we are able to run our ETL pipeline. And for just demonstrative reasons, we just read Parquet. Otherwise, we would probably write this, uh, do some cleaning and uh, write this into our curated zone, which is a database. The, the problems I've encountered is that if you think, if you start thinking of your job as an application, each application can receive uh, command line arguments. You, you can pass arguments from, uh, from via AWS console or when you deploy job as well. But uh, there are some problems with it that even though arguments looks optional, they are not optional, all arguments are required. And uh, as I mentioned, Python shell jobs and Spark jobs uh, receive uh, different default arguments, which could be also confusing because as I, since they are all required, uh, if you just move your code to a different job style, it will be a disaster. The next chapter on its own is logging. 
glue jobs log to AWS CloudWatch. Every job has uh, two log groups, one for standard output and one for standard error. Uh, there is a specific, this is for PySpark job and this is for Python shell jobs. And then each in each log group, you will have a log stream, which is constructed from a job type, output type, or output stream and uh, job run ID. There is a gotcha. Uh, the standard error stream or log is not created if the job does not finish with a failure. So if you log some, some, something into with the default Python logging, by default, uh, Python logs into standard error. So if you have just the information, everything will go to the error stream, but it will not be created when the job finishes. So you have no idea what happened. So I recommend uh, piping all logs into standard output only and don't look into error log so often. So to for reusing your code, like I said, I created this uh, shared library. It's a standard Python package with uh, with uh, which I had to pay uh, attention to a few things. It has to be. I have to create a VL file and I have to be able to execute this package extracted from a zip file. So you don't want to use uh, too many libraries in your shared code. Next thing in uh, Glue are workflows. So when you have your jobs, you will want to connect your jobs in some meaningful workflow. So in this uh, example, we have a first job and then we wait if the job succeeds and execute the next job. Uh, AWS Glue says it's uh, event driven, but this is not really a true because when the first job finishes this tr this is triggered and then you have to wait about a minute for the next job to start so i believe this is a pool based uh, queue so something like sqs so don't expect the immediate start of the next job in your pipeline uh, workflow also has its default arguments it has a workflow name and a run ID. On top of that, uh, you can store a workflow. A, you, you can store a shared state in the in the workflow object and access this state from all your jobs. So if you need to pass some data or information in between jobs, you can use uh, run properties but they are gone as soon as uh, the workflow stops. And like I said, it's only available. This uh, workflow ID is only available when you run the, the entire workflow, not one job. So it's not really simple to, to test. So I would probably recommend uh, just using a database if you need to share the sum state between jobs. Next thing is the automated deployment. So when you write your code and everything is uh, in a code repository and you have your CI CD pipeline, you have to orchestrate your pipeline to ensure that the S3, S3 buckets for your code uh, exists before uploading the, the code and your requirements 
you have to uh, you have to collect your requirements uh, from uh, file names into S3 URLs and then put them into, let's say, a Terraform. For a workflow, when you're defining your workflow as a, in a console, that's uh, quite e simple. A workflow is uh, directed acyclic graph. It's uh, created from uh, nodes and edges. However, uh, this is a little bit confusing when you're doing it for the first time, but you will get the hang of it. And when you define your workflow in a cloud formation, it looks like this which to me is very confusing because if you look at the, at the graph, that was rather simple. But if you need to write this as a code in a cloud formation, that is very confusing. And you don't really see the connections between the jobs and the triggers. So if, if, you, if we just highlight the lines, we, we declare the first job and we declare the second job and then the, how it would look for a workflow like this. You can do the same in Terraform. Where is it a little simpler? It's a little better to read. It's not simpler, it's a little better to read. So you declare your trigger resource. On a trigger, there are actions and conditions. You bind the trigger to the workflow via workflow name. Each action is what should start after the trigger. And then you can have uh, predicates in and the conditions. And these are for the second job in a row that what has to happen before. So if we look back at this schema, so this is our first trigger. These are its actions. This is our second trigger. These are now predicates and these are actions. And uh, that's it. At the beginning of the presentation, there is a link for, for the GitHub repository uh, where everything, uh, where you can deploy everything and try it out. Uh, it's deployed with the Terraform. Also, all you need is a AWS account. It will deploy a S3 bucket and, and the glue jobs and the workflow, and then you can Play around. There is also a Docker file or and the Docker Compose to try it out on your computer. And that's it. Great. Thanks a lot, Jan. Um, and I see we have a question. Um, so the question is from Mark Andre. And this person is asking: when I last reviewed Glue. They had limits on large your, on how large your job setups could be, similar to AWS Lambda. Does AWS still have those limits? Uh, yes, there, there are two, uh, two types of, of jobs, but it depends how much do you need. Uh, let me sh stop sharing my screen if I can. Yeah, there it is. Uh, you get a pretty big machine for uh, Glue 2.0. I think you get like 64 gigs uh, RAM or something. Let me look it up. You can you can use uh, multiple data processing units. And I think it can handle pretty quite a lot uh, compared to Lambda. So if you have hit any limits, uh, I would suggest contacting uh, AWS directly. 
I'm sure they, they can help out with this. Okay, but for the previous version of glue, it was, I mean, for the glue, glue 1.0, it was less, right? Yeah, it was less. Now I can see it. For, so for the uh, glue 1.0, it was four CPUs. Sorry, four, four and six, yeah, it was four, yeah. yeah. 16 gigabyte of memory. So for uh, glue 2.0, you get uh, four CPUs, uh, 16 gig gigabyte of memory, 64 gigabyte disk, or you can get higher. You get eight CPUs, 32 gigabyte of memory, and 128 gigabytes of uh, disk space. Okay. And, and then if that's not enough, uh, I think you have to optimize your job because you can have more than one DPU. Mm -hmm. and then use uh, probably Spark to s optimize this. Then, then it's really a lot about more knowing uh, Apache Spark and uh, how to optimize its code rather than knowing AWS Glue itself. And in the meantime, I have also a quick question for you. I'm just wondering why the decision was taken to use AWS Glue. It wasn't my decision. Uh, we had a client mm -hmm. and... Uh, the the idea was to use to create some ETL uh, pipeline with uh, we had several data sources and uh, the some of them appeared during the implementation of others so the the development was very fluid and AWS glue seemed to be seem to be like the easiest thing to pick because a client already invested in AWS. So it did not make sense to use uh, anything else. Yeah, but there are like other alternatives, right? I mean, uh, that's okay. Yeah, as well uh, yeah, on you, AWS. You can, you can, you can use, uh, you can use, uh, you mean from AWS or uh, yeah, other... yeah, 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 from AWS, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a batch jobs or something like that. Or just like pure AMR and so, but there are like, different options, right? Yeah, yeah, you, you can use also pure EMR and it would take me probably much more time to set up because I had really no idea what to do uh, because it, this was my first uh, PySpark project and they I was called on the project to, to help out mm -hmm. and I found out everything is wrong, so I had to redo everything. So I was really lucky that the glue is easy as is. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, once again, for your presentation, I think now we will move to the Latin talks. Um, mm. If anybody still uh, want to share something, there is there is last chance, last last wagon to jump in. Uh, so far, we have only I see only one person who signed up. Uh, but before we are getting back to the uh, better, if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, before giving space to better with his. Lighting talk, I would love to make a short announcement. So uh, for those who knows what FOSDEM is, uh, it's actually the biggest open source um, event. Uh, usually it takes place um, in Belgium. Uh, because of the COVID this year, it will be online. And before the FOSDEM is always a way to host some meetups dedicated to different languages um, that are, of course, a biggest part of this open source community. And on the 3rd of February this year, it will be an online event dedicated to Python, of course. It will be the birthday of the Python as well. And it will be, let's say, dedicated to one person who originally created the Python. So starting, from, let's say, in, in one week, uh, we as PyNetis Amsterdam will open our channels, we'll make some announcements, and we'll start into collecting questions. Uh, to ask for Guido. So I also encourage like Jan, your community as well, the Pymsterdam community, if you have any questions to Guido. Uh, so just we'll find a way to submit all these questions. And on the 3rd of February, uh, yeah, the most interesting question will be actually asked directly to Guido. So the 3rd of February, uh, this online event will take place. And now I think I will give space to Peter for the better to the lighting talk. So... Let me promote the better to the uh, panelist. Uh, Pedro, can you unmute yourself oh. now? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. 
Hey, Pedro, I haven't seen you for a while. <laughs> How are you? Hi, I'm pretty good. So for those of you who um, uh, don't know me, uh, I, as a daily job, I am a researcher. I'm trying to apply deep learning to genomics. Uh, if, if you're interested in this, we are permanently looking for a PhD student. Uh, currently, I'm sitting in Brno, Czech Republic, uh, uh, but I'm glad to be back in Amsterdam because actually I have spent several months at Free University in Amsterdam, Freie, uh, during the Socrates exchange and it was one of the best months in my life. So I'm really glad to be back. I'm trying to share the screen if no, host disabled participant sharing. Wait, uh, wait a second, I will fix it. Could you, because I have a few slides. Yep. Should I try now? Yeah, try right now. Perfect. So I'll try to share the whole desktop if possible. Okay, I hope. Yep. Is it working? Good. Yeah. So I'll be talking about my site project, which is uh, the Twitter account. I should start a timer. Uh, I'm writing with Karla Feifarova. Uh, it's daily Python tip, and we are trying to tweet something about Python every weekday. And today I will be rather speaking about the data I've got from this account through the uh, uh, Twitter data dump. So um, just for those of you who uh, don't know us, uh, so this could be like the typical tweet. Uh, something about Panda, so this is the serious one, and sometimes we are trying to do like the less serious one, like are you feeling stressed, then if you like reverse stressed, you've got the desserts and you're not so much stressed anymore. Okay, so uh, this is rough, we are now writing Python tip for four years, so this is like four years of Python tip in one word cloud. Uh, this is our followers, uh, uh, it's slightly older version, but it's making the point that we have quite diverse audience, many people from India or Africa, we are quite proud of it. And if you want to see the data I will be talking today, you, uh, you can, they're publicly available, I basically mm, clean this uh, Twitter dump uh, to, to remove just the replies and we've got uh, a clean CSV table with roughly uh, 1000 Python tip and put it on the GitHub. So if, if you want to make your own version, what makes a tweet popular, you can do it. And what basically I've done is I have to take those 1000 Python tips and define some, uh, you know, characteristics, some, uh, some variables and, and try to see what's, what's the most influential. But before I even can start it, if, if I'm mm, speaking about the popularity or getting attention, you have two things you can look at. You have the number of favorites and you have the number of retweets. And like to do any statistics, you need just one number. So there are like multiple ways how to do that. What, what I've did is, is I roughly put, you know, the, all the tweets onto one graph. And you can see that roughly, if, if you put the line through that, uh, that, that it's roughly like one retweet is four favorites. So I have defined the popularity score that basically put like four times retweets plus favorites. So this is how I measure the popularity of a tweet. Uh, okay, uh, what then if you look like, uh, then also I've put it on the log scale to, to somehow st stabilize the variance. And, and you can see that even if now we have like much more followers than three years ago, it's uh, it's not so much uh, more likes. So, so after a year, it's, it's like roughly stabilized. So that's what I use as the data for the analysis. And that's basically it. And then I was asking like the question, like uh, one of the most influential thing is whether the tweet contains a medium, like, either the picture or the video. I'm always trying to find some nice pictures. So I've thought, oh, that's good. But when I've actually looked at the data, it's uh, like, the, so the majority of the tweets contains media, but if it contains the media, the popularity score is actually lower. 
Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, I hope so. So this is the box plot, this the line in the middle is the median. So you can see that if, if it contains a, a picture or video, then this, then like the distribution is lower than for those that doesn't. So it was one my first like real surprise. I didn't expect that. I still want to like a bit more understand what, what's happening here, but like the statistics is pretty clear. Uh, the if you you know of course if you, if you use something like the t test or something it's highly significant like ten to the power of minus sixteen. Uh, the second most powerful was whether it contains uh, a mention like to some other user. And again, if it does, then it's uh, less popular, which again was not something I, I would guess. Uh, the second was whether it contains a hashtag. Uh, surprisingly, if it contains a hashtag, it's more popular. I don't have a, a plot for here, but if it contains two hashtags, then it's more popular than one hashtag, which I, I still like have to want to believe. Uh, then we try to convince our followers to uh, to contribute the tip, either we have some Google form or they can just mention us. And uh, we should stop writing because the tweets from our followers are more popular than our own. Uh, I'm almost out of time. So if it contains a link, it's less popular. The other factors is if it contains the emoji, it's more popular. The longer tweets are more popular. We have many data scientists, so the tweets are about pandas or about Jupyter notebooks are more popular and the tweets with uh, example in the tweet are more popular. This is our hall of fame. So this is the most popular tweet at, at all. If you reverse the flag of England, you will got the flag of Poland. Is No, I'm not sure which, which country is that. Uh, this is hand calc, which is uh, awesome thing. Like you put the Python code and you've got the LaTeX code, even the formulas. So that's, that was quite popular at the time. Uh, the second is again emoji. So uh, we finally sorted out whether the chicken or the egg comes the first. You just do sort it. Uh, and finally, we are trying to put together like the best tweets from those 1000. And like our final intention, intention is put it as a book or something. So especially if you've never heard about us, we've put like the simple web page that randomly generate 25 tips and you can help us like uh, sort of giving us your opinion, the quality of the tweet on the scale from one to seven. And if we will ever write a book, we will give like, I believe it's 60%, 70% discount count if you, if you give us a contact to you at the end. So if, if you want to try us, if you do the, to the bit dot, ly slash pi amsterdam 2020 yeah, you can uh, i will probably put this into a chat as well uh, you can try you you will see 25 randomly generated tips and that's everything for me sorry for going slightly over time uh, we have over time today from the very beginning, so it's okay. Uh, we have a quick question for you. Uh, it comes from Marco, and it says, did I understand correctly that these features you mentioned were sorted by their influence on the tweet's popularity? If yes, so, if so, in what way were you measuring the impact? Uh, you know, it, it was as stupid as uh, doing the t-test and looking on the p-value of the t-test or the t-statistics. That's basically the same thing. Uh, I believe I, yeah, I look at the t-statistics and, and sort it by, by this. Because it's all like zero, one thing. So it's like basically two groups. Okay. Yeah, I also have a question. Uh, is the that data are publicly available or do you keep it private for yourself? Uh, and now uh, do you think uh, about the tweets or about the evaluations? Uh, basically anything from this uh, presentation. Okay, <laughs> so the tweets are publicly available. Uh, I've mentioned it, if, if you go to the daily Python tip today, there is the link to the CSV table that, that is basically this Twitter data dump that I've just a bit cleaned it up. 
like, like make it easier for people. Like I uh, put out the retweets and replies, but otherwise it's it's the text of the tweet and number of likes, number of retweets, and and like mid links to the medias and, and things like that. So so it's publicly nice. available. Even I've put the list of our followers that I've got through the tweet. Pi uh, Python library because it's it's not so easy. Like uh, the the Twitter limit for the API is like nine hundred uh, uh, requests uh, per fifteen minutes, which which is okay if you have a thousand followers, but it's not so much. Uh, it's it, it started to be complicated if you have twenty two thousand. So so I even for for myself. I've like let it run yeah. through the through the night and then in, in the morning. Yeah, basically, Twitter protects against its yes. uh, against yes. the data mining. Exactly, like what I wanted to do, and I didn't manage to do it. I, I wanted to do some like nice graph when I would look for every follower, like to who to his or her followers, but basically make the look at the followers of the followers. And it's not possible because you can do only like one request per minute, or or you can do like fifteen per fifteen minutes, but which like translates like one request per minute. And if you have twenty two thousand of them, there's like no way how to do that. I think it's possible, but uh, you should pay for it. So actually, yes. like they provide yeah. this as a paid service, they call it analytics, and then they give you everything that you want, almost everything, of course, for a specific sum of money. I had never done that. So so I was even like looking for something like if it would be as possible to get it for like 10 euros, I would do that. But I, I like... It's not 10 euros, no. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's much more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I felt to, to accomplish that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pader. Um, yeah, so I think that's actually, I don't see any other uh, incoming light talks. Uh, so I would like to say thank you to Nancy and Fian for speaking. Um, and of course, um, happy Christmas, happy new year, despite all the things that's happening. So we always have positive parts as uh, communities. And Python, Jan, do you want to share anything else? Uh, yeah, I would just want to plug in uh, our community website. So, so let me share the screen. Zoom just disappeared. Okay. So you should be you should see my screen now. Yes. So as I mentioned in the chat. Uh, there is a link for the repository for my talk. There is also a more detailed uh, mini series of articles of my complaints and the learnings from this journey. And if you want to know more about Py Amsterdam, you go to py.amsterdam and you arrive at our website. Uh, you can see what is the latest event uh, and you can submit a talk if you want to host an event when we are back in offices you can also submit the option for the hosting and if you make a if you talk in our events or do something for Phi Amsterdam you will be mentioned on this page as well the oh. I, I believe you can do the same with the Pi ladies so you can type Amsterdam Amsterdam dot pyladies dot com. Dot com. Yeah. You arrive at their website. It's more yes. professional. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you click on for programmers, then where you end up for, yep. Give a beginner's workshop, start with a tech talk, give an advanced workshop. And the rest is always uh, the GitHub below, the Meetup below, the YouTube channel, everything is here. Yep. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I think, I yeah. think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much once again. Yeah, and we'll finalize in this. Thanks everyone who stayed out until the end. Yeah, <laughs> for the strongest, right? Yeah. Merry Christmas and happy Pythoning. 
Happy holidays. Sure.